Welcome to part 11 of this series on Moby Dick. In this lecture, we will discuss chapters 66 through 73. In chapter 66, the Pequod's crew kills the sharks that are feasting on the dead whale by stabbing them with harpoons. Ishmael describes how the sharks remain undeterred by the crew's efforts and even begin to eat their dead comrades and parts of themselves. They viciously snapped, not only at each other's disembowelments, but like flexible bows bent round and bit their own, till those entrails seemed swallowed over and over again by the same mouth, to be oppositely voided by the gaping wound. The nature of the sharks is similar to the nature of some humans. Both subjects feed on the energy of others, and sometimes consume themselves in self-destructive practices. In chapter 67, Ishmael describes how the crew harvests the blubber from the whale. The ivory Pequod was turned into what seemed a shamble, every sailor a butcher. You would have thought we were offering up 10,000 red oxen to the sea gods. In chapter 68, Ishmael discusses the advantages of whale blubber. It keeps a whale warm in the frigid seas of the Arctic and keeps a whale cool in the warm waters of the tropics. Ishmael advises mankind to become resilient to external circumstances like the great whales. O man, admire and model thyself after the whale. Do thou too remain warm among ice. Do thou too live in this world without being of it. Be cool at the equator. Keep thy blood fluid at the pole. Like the great dome of St. Peter's and like the great whale, retain, O man, in all seasons a temperature of thine own. In chapter 69, Ishmael describes how the birds and sharks desecrate the whale carcass after the crew has processed and thrown it overboard. He remarks that the universe, which the birds and sharks symbolize, does not honor anything, even the mighty whale. There is a most doleful and most mocking funeral, the sea vultures all in pious mourning, the air sharks all punctiliously in black or speckled. In life but few of them would have helped the whale, I ween, if peradventure he had needed it. But upon the banquet of his funeral they most piously do pounce. O oh, horrible vulturism of earth, from which not the mightiest whale is free. In chapter 70, Ahab speaks to the severed head of the sperm whale. His soliloquy is a meditation on the cruelty and indifference of the universe. Ahab asks the dead whale to reveal the meaning of suffering in the world, but he receives no response. According to Ahab, the problem of suffering is sufficient to compel even Abraham, the father of the monotheistic religions of the modern world, to rebel against the order of the universe. Of all divers, thou hast dived the deepest. That head upon which the upper sun now gleams has moved amid this world's foundations, where unrecorded names and navies rust, and untold hopes and anchors rot, where in her murderous hold this frigate earth is ballasted with bones of millions of the drowned. There in that awful waterland, there was thy most familiar home. Thou hast been where bell or diver never went, hast slept by many a sailor's side, where sleepless mothers would give their lives to lay them down. Thou sawest the locked lovers when leaping from their flaming ship. Heart to heart they sank beneath the exulting wave, true to each other when heaven seemed false to them. Thou sawest the murdered mate when tossed by pirates from the midnight deck. For hours he fell into the deeper midnight of the insatiate maw, and his murderers still sailed on unharmed, while swift lightning shivered the neighboring ship that would have borne a righteous husband to outstretched longing arms. O oh, head! Thou hast seen enough to split the planets and make an infidel of Abraham, and not one syllable is thine. In chapter 71, the Pequod encounters another ship called the Jeroboam. There is a plague on the Jeroboam, so the ship's captain does not come aboard the Pequod, but he does tell Ahab that Moby Dick recently killed a member of their crew, in accordance with the prophecy of another crew member who claims to be the archangel Gabriel. The prophet Gabriel yells to Ahab to beware of Moby Dick. Ahab defies the warning, and then Gabriel proclaims that Ahab will suffer the same fate of the dead crew member. In chapter 72, Ishmael explains the process by which the blubber is removed from a whale. First, a crew member inserts a blubber hook into the whale. In order to do this, one crew member lowers another over the side of the ship onto the whale. In the case of the Pequod, Ishmael lowers Queequeg onto the whale. Ishmael remarks that any mistake by either Queequeg or himself will result in both of their deaths. I saw that this situation of mine was the precise situation of every mortal that breathes. 
Only in most cases, he, one way or other, has this Siamese connection with a plurality of other mortals. If your banker breaks, you snap. If your apothecary by mistake sends you poison in your pills, you die. In chapter 73, Ahab commands the crew to kill a right whale. Stubb asks Flask why Ahab wants a right whale, considering that a right whale is far less valuable than a sperm whale. Flask tells Stubb that Fadala convinced Ahab that a ship with the head of a sperm whale along one side of it and the head of a right whale along the other side can never capsize. Stubb and Flask do not trust Fadala. Stubb even asserts that Fadala is the devil in disguise. He is the devil, I say. The reason why you don't see his tail is because he tucks it up out of sight. He carries it coiled away in his pocket. When the head of the right whale is attached to the Pequod on the side opposite to the head of the sperm whale, the ship returns to a natural balance. But Ishmael notes that the ship would sail better without the heads. He makes an analogy between this situation and that of a scholar who harbors the conflicting ideas of Kant and Locke within his mind. As before, the Pequod steeply leaned over towards the sperm whale's head. Now, by the counterpoise of both heads, she regained her even keel. Though sorely strained, you may well believe. So, when on one side you hoist in Locke's head, you go over that way, but now on the other side hoist in Kant's and you come back again, but in very poor plight. Thus some minds forever keep trimming boat. Oh, ye foolish, throw all these thunderheads overboard, and then you will float light and right. Don't forget to subscribe and join us for part 12 of this series on Moby Dick.